passion and commitment. AOL Creative Voices is very pleased to welcome Jonathan Sackett, Managing Director of Content for OB North America and Chairman of the International Association of Internet Practitioners. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you. I was in the advertising and marketing program in college, uh, but my brother was a, a tech guy. And he was actually one of the heads of technology of Harley Davidson and Kohler and companies like that. I didn't realize that I was learning uh, the technological vernacular um, from him. So I think digital was a natural fit because it was kind of the, back then it was the, hopefully it still is, the marriage of technology with marketing and advertising. So, you know, I found uh, instantly that I could talk with the tech guys and make sense of it. So I, I think initially I was almost more of a translator than anything. You know, so you've got the account people who weren't speaking the same language as the creative people who weren't speaking the same language as the tech guys. So I was almost that weird hybrid in the middle of all three groups. One of the first uh, digital agencies, uh, it was in Milwaukee and New York, which is, seems odd, but uh, they were called Spectracom. And we did all the first websites for companies that, which, you know, you and I will probably remember and no one else will, but Warner Lambert. Uh, Park Davis, I did the first, my team and I did the first website for Purdue Farms. Uh, we actually sat at the table with Jim and Frank Purdue. And I remember them asking me at the time, you know, well, why, why do we need a website? And I said, well, you know, I don't know, this is what we do. So, you know, I, I, back then, nobody had websites. So then Harley Davidson and Kohler. Um, back then, it was just about web builds, you know. Um, and really what it came about then. That was then, when, early 90s? Yeah, that was around 94, 95. And back then it was digital only. You know, there was no hybrid agencies really that did both. Um, and from there I moved to Chicago and became the first digital employee for Townsend Agency. Each step along the path has had a victory, you know, one that kind of defines you. You know, when I was with uh, Draft, uh, which became Draft FCB, um, I think it was the, the Milk account and ultimately the My M&Ms where you could write on the candy. The original prototype for that was to write on a Snickers bar. That didn't go over, so once we met with them, they, they call their M&Ms lentils. So we came up with the e-commerce engine, we came up with the triggered communications, and the positioning for selling writing on candy. Right? That was the defining moment to draft FCB. Uh, I moved on to Boston, where I was uh, chief digital officer for Arnold in all of their offices, and there the defining moment was the islands of the Bahamas. Um, and really, that was more about you know, changing it from digital destination to digital infusion. You know, a lot of it came from, you know, how do you attract the bots, right, the kayaks of the world and things like that. Because people don't just go to Bahamas.com, right? You're looking for vacation, sun and sand, things like that. So that was more about building a, a digital ecosystem, I think. And, and, you know, ecosystem's a little bit overused, but, but I think that was really the turning point, was we found a way to create a digital footprint for the Bahamas. From there, I went to the Mighty Martin Agency, which I, I still love and I still keep in contact with everyone there. Um, there we did Geico, we did Walmart, we did UPS, we did all those things. And I think the turning point there, which you're familiar with, uh, with was We Choose the Moon, uh, which was the JFK Memorial. Uh, that was the big turning point because that became, uh, you know, 40 years later of our trip to the moon, minute by minute coverage to the day, right, to the second. I think with content, unfortunately, it's been misunderstood or, or overused in some cases, you know. I always look at it as uh, Mike Hughes, who's a good old friend of mine from the Martin Agency. We always used to call it Mike's Bowl, right? Most agencies say, well, there's an umbrella, and then under that umbrella, you fit these things, right? Well, we'd always say it's Mike's Bowl. You want to fill it with something. And I think the word content, whether that's the right word or not, I think historically people have thought of it as a placeholder. So here's a box, now fill it with content right, versus the insights that fuel the content. I think everybody doesn't enter a brand's door through that same door. It just doesn't work that way. If I had a bad um, uh, customer service call with my car insurance, suddenly that's going to be top of mind when I call Geico or I call the next insurance company. I want them to be friendly, right? So you have to, what has to happen is a hierarchy of that content. The information you want to convey, where you want to convey it, when you want to convey it, and how you want to convey it. 
Digital is in my DNA, and it, it's mainly because I, I grew up with it, right? Uh, as, as a lot of your viewers of uh, AOL Voices have, I think what happens is I have to, to succeed, I have to separate myself from the digital discipline a little bit more than I have in the past. Because this is channel agnostic, and knowing that digital has been part of my, uh, my and my team's arsenal for so long, it's difficult to separate that, you know? You, 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 the digital mind jumps to search vernacular, jumps to social scouring, jumps to web build and technologies. It's got to be more about the soul of the brand. You know, I, I would look at it more as an inside out type of approach. I, I, like Walmart, for example, I thought uh, the team on that did a brilliant job of, of saying it's more than a bouncing smiley face. It was backing up from that to say, you know, it's, it's, to us it's, part, it's, it's more about being friendly and it's not the money you save, it's the time. So getting into that positioning, if I back into it through search vernacular, great. But I think it's got to be more uh, or less, more or less channel agnostic than it has before in my career. Starting with my family, uh, my, my parents and my brother, which uh, probably sounds strange, but my, my brother being a tech guy, you know, I, you, like I said earlier, you don't realize that you're learning something until you have those conversations, and sometimes you don't realize it then. My parents also, you know, they taught me simplicity uh, rules of the day because my parents are not tech whizzes. And back in the day when we were building all these first websites, what we would do is we would literally have my parents take a look at them to see if they could figure them out or navigate them, you know. And we, we would call it being uh, Richard and Kathy proof. Um, but that helped, that helped ground me. It really did. Um, over the years, obviously, you've been a mentor to me. So it's out Thank there you. now. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that you taught me was uh, to listen first and then talk. Um, and I think that's really important. Everybody has something to say, you know, uh, it's a line in a song, listen to fools and sages, right? Everybody's got an opinion, everybody's got a point of view. Um, John Adams at the Martin Agency, uh, you know, he taught me to stay above a lot of the negativity that can be in this industry. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I think there's an insecurity at agencies, at people at agencies, at some people that work at these agencies. What ends up happening is that insecurity bleeds into social media. So, you know, I'll read about a colleague of mine who got promoted and somebody's got to knock him down a notch or two. You know, it, it happens. But John, uh, John Adams has always been so far above that and, and such an inspiration to me because, you know, he says, yeah, don't listen to that stuff. What's, what's the prize? You know, you always say, what's the win? John says, what's the prize? What are we after? What are we trying to do? Anything else is in the way. And I think that's pretty much what everybody's taught me. My parents had never been to France, and I really wanted to bring them there. And I was so fortunate that uh, I knew people there, of course, so I could get my parents on the guest list to a lot of these parties. And uh, I brought my, not only brought my parents to Cannes, I brought them to the awards, I brought them to the parties. And, you know, my, my parents grew up in Beaverdam, Wisconsin, if you've ever heard of that. And we moved to Menominee Falls, which was a suburb of Milwaukee. So my parents are uh, very good people, very solid people, and, you know, very small town. They're happy there. They, they, they like that atmosphere. So bringing them to Cannes was like taking them to, you know, the moon for, for people like you and me. But they really enjoyed it. And the peop number of people that came up and introduced themselves to my parents, chairman of some of the holding companies and old bosses and friends of mine, I mean, they were the, the bells of the ball just because people knew that they'd never been to something like that. So... At the end of it, I, I went from, you know, people questioning why I would bring my parents to people going, oh my God, that was so cool to meet your parents, you know? You can't teach somebody to be hungry for something. You can only capitalize on their strengths. And, uh, you know, I work with students a lot, um, through the, both through the association and through the, you know, I, I give a lot of speeches. What I find uh, oftentimes is that their, their hunger is misplaced because it hasn't been guided. guided. You know, they're learning what they're learning from textbooks and from professors who, you know, may or may not be too close to the industry and what we're doing. I think that finding their passion and applying it is probably what I do better than, than just simply give them the hunger. You know, I'm working with some students right now uh, at, at Ogilvy, at, at the corporate office here in New York, and, and what they're, they're, some of the things that they're learning are good, but they're not able to apply it. You know, everybody, if you watch a TV commercial, we all have an opinion. If you visit a website, you have an opinion of it. I don't think that people are realizing how to capitalize on your hunger for what you were really looking for. I don't go to geico.com every day. I, I go to google.com every day. I go to AOL every day and AOL properties, Huffington Post. You know, what am I really looking for and what am I doing? People aren't very good at checking their own habits 
and then realizing, oh, that's not exactly what I was looking for, and now what should I be doing, and what's a better, bigger way to think about things. I just, I really enjoy what I do, and I think that passion comes through. I mean, you know, you've, you've been with me in meetings. I, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to get me to stop talking, I'm sure, but, but I think that people see that, that there's passion, patience, persistence, and perseverance that, that just keeps driving us, and it's contagious when you're with the right people. You know, it was amazing to me a few years back when, when I co-founded it with, uh, with my partners that it didn't exist. And I, I, I get asked so many times, that, you know, where are you getting your information? You know, should I go to Wired or eMarketer or, or some of these properties? Oftentimes the people, I found that the people that have the time to write the articles aren't the ones that are living it anymore. Because, you know, if you're living it, you're working a lot of hours. So what I wanted to do simply was this, was give a global platform uh, and let people share information. Oftentimes I've found in digital or in advertising, people are keepers of the knowledge. You know, they don't want to be open sourced or share that information. I want to share it. I want to get better constantly. And you know, I found things in emerging markets, uh, emerging countries for digital, or, or these markets where mobile is taking off more than the US. Why not just talk directly to those people versus read an article? And that's all I really set out to do. And now we've got uh, registered uh, users and, and members from 70 countries and over 30,000 people without a dime in media. It's just, it's, it's interesting to me that people were looking for something that didn't exist, so all we did was create it. Especially nowadays with social media, right? That's the other buzz. People are forgetting how dangerous it can be, you know? And I think um, one of the things that I heard, uh, I think it was from Spider-Man, if I remember correctly, it was uh, with great power comes great responsibility. I, I, I'm so fortunate to work with some of the best people in the industry and to keep in contact with some of the best people in the industry, but we have a responsibility. You know, um, the, you know there's, there's sexting going on, there's um, people putting up pictures of themselves and doing things that you might not that you put that out there, that's forever. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to teach people, look, you know, have fun and the internet is a great place and mobile is a great thing to use, but what's a safer way to use it? So the objective of WebWise Kids is to teach parents to teach their kids that responsibility. And, and it's working too. We're, we go through all the school systems, uh, we're nationwide now, um, and I just thought it was something that I really, really wanted to do and, it, and it's working. AOL should not be a surprise. To anyone and, it, and it's a surprise to people you know uh, I think the Huffington Post was was a good move I think the hyper local targeting that AOL now has is is huge because Google can't do things like that you know it, um, depending upon who you ask there's entities out there that think they can do it they really can't and really localizing that web is what's exciting to me I think that's to me that's the biggest power that AOL has is that lo that hyper localization because again how often times are you doing just a simple search or trying to look for something in your neighborhood and then it's going to the vastness of the internet you know that's the talk about a needle in a haystack it's unbelievable to me that's that's the future is that hyper local targeting and what we used to refer to as wearable web right so those web applications that stick with you and help you in store and help you online not just disappear once you do a search you know, I think, I think it's, it's twofold at least. One is to make sure that you've got the right partners. Now, I, I work with your, your agency teams, which are great people. You know, agencies are tough to partner with, historically. I, you know, I, I've been there, so it's, I think partnering with them is tough. It's getting the right people inside of those agencies to make sure that they're socializing you. You know, never, you know the, the taboo is never sell inside of an agency, right? That's, that's the taboo. But if you socialize it, then you're moving the right direction. I also think that um, with AOL properties, it, it, to me it's almost like with all of the vastness of the properties that AOL has, it's almost become the best kept secret and, and uh, it shouldn't be. Now it's expensive, it's a very expensive proposition to reintroduce something, you know, um, or to get people to reappraise something, right? So I think what's got to happen is um, Huffington Post has an interesting thing where they basically let you publish yourself. Right? Because a lot of these properties out there are publishers won't publish you. I think that's huge. But I think getting those people who are publishing to you and with you to get them to be your advocates outside of your properties is going to be the next huge frontier. So it's between localization, the right partnerships at the agencies, and the right mouthpieces, which to me are, are those people publishing through you. 
One of them is, is uh, the promise of mobile in the United States. We've heard that coming, that train's been coming for so long. I still don't think we're doing a good job of using it. I'm not sure why that is. You know, I, I, maybe it's the, the diversity of cell phones. It could be a number of things. Uh, I think cellular usage is through the roof, but cellular technologies and apps and things like that aren't being utilized to their full potential, no doubt about it. I think the experiential things are the things I'm most excited about. I want us to get better at mobile in the United States. But I think, I really honestly believe that the experiential things, um, getting, you know, we had built a prototype not too long ago where I could actually interact with that television commercial. So there was a famous actor we used for a credit card company, so I, I won't go into details, but he throws something at the screen and I catch it on my cell phone. I think that cell phone interaction in an experiential format with television and with these other third screens, I think that's the frontier. Because why can't I watch that commercial and just hit a button right now? It, they know who I am. They know where I am. They know when it's running. Why isn't somebody taking full advantage of that third screen to get it to interact? That's, that's what I'm most excited about. I'm active in the community. I think, you know, what, what usually happens is social conversations for me, real social conversations for me, usually end up being about work. Uh, I'm almost as bad as Mike Hughes at the Martin Agency. But outside of that, you know, I, I jog, I bike, I do things like that. But, but mostly it comes down to social conversations about work. And oftentimes a lot of my friends have split off from the ad agency world uh, and are starting up small businesses. So I frequent their restaurants, I frequent their stores, and it usually becomes a, a, a non-paid consulting gig. Um, but I live it, I breathe it, this is what I do, it's what I love. So, you know, to me that's, that's my work is my social atmosphere as well. So the two really uh, have blended together quite well. So Jonathan Sackett, you've done some great things for the industry in this new role in content. Uh, we'll be watching to see how you define it and lead the way for others. It's a pleasure to have you here and it's a pleasure to be your friend. Oh, thanks David, I appreciate that. Passionate, incredible, talent.